Good morning and welcome to this um, PADAM Mobility Seminar, webinar, um, Accessing Rural Bus Services, How Can We Ensure Equity, organised by Landor. Um, my name is Matthew Clark. I'm an Associate Director at STEER. I lead STEER's work in new mobility. I'm also the Chair of Como UK. So I'm delighted to welcome you to this seminar today. Um, we've got two speakers um, who I'll introduce in a minute. Um, we've got James West, who is UK Business Development uh, head for Padden Mobility, and we also have Alice Missler, who is Demand Responsive and Community Transport Team Leader at Hertfordshire County Council. I'm going to hand over to James in a moment. Um, we've already had uh, lots of questions from people who are attending, so we've been working through some of those questions after the presentation from James and Alice. Um, we are also inviting questions from uh, the audience. Um, if you can put those in the Q&A uh, tab, which you should be able to find at the bottom of your Zoom um, uh, screen, that would be great, and we'll come to those at the end. So with no further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, James and Alice. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Matt, for the introduction, and good morning after everyone. So yes, we're here today, uh, myself from Padam Mobility and Alice uh, from Hertfordshire County County, and we're going to talk about uh, accessing rural bus services and about how we can ensure equity, how do we make sure that everyone can have a service and that service level is uh, a base that they would expect and is uh, meeting their needs. And if we just jump to the next uh, slide, we're going to start with a bit uh, about us both. Uh, and as Matt mentioned, uh, on the next slide, you'll just see a bit about us. So if we could just jump, there we go. So uh, as Matt mentioned, myself, James, uh, I lead on the UK business development uh, for Bidam Mobility. Uh, and Alice, um, if you want to say a few words about yourself uh, from Hertfordshire. Yeah, thanks, James. So hi, my name is Alice Misser, and I am the team leader for Demand Responsive Transport and Community Transport at Hertfordshire County Council. Excellent. So we're going to talk a bit of first about um, Padam Mobility, who we are. Um, and if we could just jump uh, forward, you'll see that since May 2021, we have been part of the Siemens Mobility family and within that, the wider Siemens family. So what that allows us to do is we are part of a software unit where we have um, some other sister companies and the real benefit for that um, from us coming from a DRT perspective is as you can see on the right there no longer are we just talking about DRT and paratransit and autonomous vehicles but we're actually able to link up uh, with our sister companies to look at payment and ticketing uh, rail capacity trip planning and passing information which really gives us sort of that whole transport ecosystem that we can deliver in partnership with, with some of the partners that, that Siemens gives us. And if you go forward, we'll see how we're doing um, since we've been founded in 2014. So we are now the French market leader. Uh, we were founded in Paris. This is the market which we first grew. And you can see that um, the number of services corresponding to the key in the bottom right talks about a lot of different types of services. We're talking about some services that are sort of peri-urban and suburban, suburban areas. So here we're talking about sort of the Ile-de-France region where the DRT is sort of 50 to 60 kilometers outside the center of Paris. We're not talking specifically about a DRT, for example, from the Champs-Élysées to the Eiffel Tower, but rather how could we get you, if you think about from a greater London perspective to places like Watford and further afield so that people could then connect and make multimodal journeys to services um, sort of in the Pays de la Loire region, which are similar to what we'll be talking about today with Alice, where we've got very rural areas, areas of large um, size, but actually relatively few number of vehicles. And if we look also to a, a wider perspective, you'll see that we are covering sort of 100 um, services on the next slide about not just in um, the UK, but further afield in Spain, Italy, Switzerland and Germany. And our presence there uh, in the UK is currently growing. So we've got Cheshire, Gloucestershire, Hertfordshire, Lincolnshire, uh, Surrey and Leicestershire. And also um, in 2016, Padam was part of the, the team that launched the first um, DRT service in the UK. And we look forward to adding some new names uh, to that list in the not so near future. So we'll come now to talking about the interfaces uh, we provide and what we offer uh, our clients and what we offer is three key different types. We have uh, a booking interface and that stems from a booking website or a user booking app and we also provide that for call centers and then for the operators to be able to see where the fleet is at any one time we have a management interface and you can see 
not just where the vehicles are, but who's traveling on those vehicles, where they were meant to be traveling to, where they picked up on time. And then the driver application to know where they need to go, who they need to pick up, and are they going to do it uh, on time or with a little bit of the delay. And we can also have additional information displayed there, such as if the passenger needs to um, have additional loading time, if they have a mobility need and that sort of thing. And we have, of course, the, the navigation uh, embedded in that. So that links to both Google Maps or Waze, depending on the user preference. And one thing to note just on the uh, booking interface for call centers, we allow people to act on behalf of other users. And that's something that Alice will touch upon later for, for a dialer ride point of view is if someone has an elderly relative that perhaps isn't able to, to use a computer or use a, a phone, they can book and have full visibility on how they're working. And I just think it's important to add before we um, jump forward is I think sometimes in DRT we can talk about equity in terms of are we providing a digital landscape that works for everyone and can an app sometimes be prohibitive and we tend to see about 75 to 85 percent of all bookings across our platform for our services both in the UK uh, and further afield are through um, the user booking app so sort of you know three and four uh, if not a bit more are booked through that but we still understand that there are some digital needs that we still need to understand and sort of go further with and that's why we still provide the booking interface for call centers and, and the user booking website as well so i want to talk to you now about the the lead headline that we discussed earlier transport equity how do we take what we've got now and how do we address it in the future what's that going to look like so i think i'll first talk about how we can address um, connectivity issues and if we just come now to what we have as the state of play today, uh, what the current challenges are and how we can go forward in the future. So today we're in a position, it's very well publicized. There's a lot of car ownership. People are very attracted to their personal car uh, and they think that's sort of sometimes the be all and end all of, of transport. And the challenge is then that public transport is not viewed as something that's attractive. It's not viewed as something that's viable uh, for their journey types. So how can we address this? So we have the current opportunity with the, the £2 fare cap, where we may see that some users are now using public transport for the first time in a long time or the first time in um, perhaps their, their lifetime where they're trying out the bus. But the key challenge will be is are the users that are, are doing that, are they going to stay once the fare cap goes or are they just going to disappear and go back to their old transport habits? And because people are attracted to the, the personal car and their personal vehicle, there's that low perceived uh, cost of car ownership. And we've got to think about that versus the climate crisis and all the ambitions that we have to sort of decarbonize transport in general. And the additional challenge now with the cost of living crisis is how are people having to rethink their personal transport habits with uh, fuel costs, the cost of running a car and everything else versus something like a two pound fare where they can use the journey in a more sustainable manner. So that brings me to what we've got to do in the future. We've got to try and understand how we can increase the public transport uptake, particularly in rural areas. And we, to do that, we need to think how public transport can be designed to be accessible and appealing. It's got to you know, hit those two nails on the head. And to do that, we need to think about how is the network going to integrate, not just with DRT, but how can DRT integrate with a network that provides uh, additional bus journeys, additional train journeys to make that multimodal option possible. And one way we want to talk about that is about uh, funding for DRT. So there's lots of options and sources of funding, but I think if we look at uh, now the silos that you could have, we've got there five options from public transport, community transport, health, school, and also private funding. And these currently exist in uh, five separate silos. And I think, as you can see there, we've got use cases where the DRT can work for them um, in every manner. But actually, I think what we've got to do is go that one step further and think, how can we interwork these fundings? How can we use some funding from home to school or SEN transport and interwork that with other funds such as for a mobility fund, uh, BSIP or FTZ, etc. And on the next slide, I've got an example where we're looking at not just restricting the silos of those funds, but rather how can we interwork the vehicles that are accessing those funds? So you could have, for example, these three vehicles here, they're doing work for an industrial state, perhaps for a privately funded um, corporate shuttle in the morning, then they can do some feeders to go to the stations to make those multimodal journeys we mentioned earlier, back to doing some uh, corporate work around midday, perhaps for the, the shift work, and then back to a regular DRT. And so here we're interworking not just the vehicles and the funds, 
to really make sure that we maximize the usage of the vehicle, maximize the potential patronage on a service to ensure that people understand this is how public transport can work. This is slightly different to perhaps the perception they had and ensure that that positive uh, experience and positive reinforcement goes forward. And not just about the, the silos, I want to talk about how we can stay connected and how the future of transport can address these issues. And I think we'll see later when, when Alice talks about how Harsings has been designed, that DDRT, other on-demand services, they can uh, complement and coexist with other public transport services. And we're not talking about anything that's massively complex here. We want to keep things very simple and, and easy to understand. You know, the fare type, the trip type, where can I go? Make that nice and simple and ensure that the trips that are being provided are connecting people or connecting communities to other transport hubs to enable that multimodal journey option. And then the reciprocal of that is what does the community, what does the region get as a benefit is they get that potential to, to be unlocked um, and where they were underserved perhaps by bus services that you know, perhaps 10 years ago they were 15 minutes or every half an hour to so five years ago they went to every hour every two hours to today having nothing with DRT we can sort of go further into that community and provide a new level of access for them and this means that we can design and implement some services that fit the needs of rural areas and sort of communities across the region of course we're not talking purely about a one-size uh, fits all approach but actually we can take the learnings from the services that we have across the UK and abroad and use those as best practice to go forward to help deliver and unlock that potential. So I want to just come now to the two services that we are operating with Hertfordshire County Council. We have here um, the HeartSync service, which is funded by the Rural Mobility Fund, and also the dial ride service, which is countywide and has a more specific need. And Alice, I'll let you explain a bit more in detail about how they two differ and the challenges and success you've had with them to date. Brilliant. Thanks, James. Um, yeah, so as James mentioned, we have our two services that we're going to be talking about today. Um, so our first one is Hearts Links, which is our demand responsive transport service in North and East Hearts, uh, which is funded by the Rural Mobility Fund. Um, so just to give a bit of an overview um, on the next slide as to where Hearts Links came from. In March 2021, Hertfordshire County Council was awarded uh, 1.4 million after a successful bid for the Rural Mobility Fund. Um, and as a result, we launched Hearts Links just six months later in September 2021. And this scheme is currently operating between seven and seven on Mondays to Saturdays. Um, and our new evening service launched uh, last month, which has increased that now from 8 p.m. to 11.30 p.m. on Fridays and Saturdays as well. Um, and then on Sundays and bank holidays, we operate 10 till 4. And this has substantially improved both the range and choice of destinations available for our residents. Um, there are currently four 16-seat Mercedes Sprinter low four buses um, in operation on the service, and all of these are fully wheelchair accessible. They have free passenger Wi-Fi and USB charging points at every seat as well. And whilst it was our intention to launch the service with five vehicles at the beginning, um, we made the decision to reduce the number of starting vehicles, vehicles down to three, um, and this was due to the impacts of COVID-19 um, and what that impact had had on public transport patronage. Uh, but we will be increasing our fleet up to five vehicles within the next few months. Um, but the operating zone centres around a village of Buntingford um, and also the surrounding villages around there. And this is what we um, call the free floating zone. So within this zone, passengers can travel between any two designated Hearts Links bus stops. And in addition to the free floating zone, um, we also have our key hub towns, which are six uh, towns which surround our free floating zone. Um, and passengers can travel from any Hartslinks pickup point uh, within the free floating zone to a stop in the key hub town. Um, but you can't travel between two stops within the same town. This is to avoid uh, competition with other fixed line services, for example. Um, but we do have nearly 400 virtual bus stops within our op operating zone at the moment. And we do always um, review stop requests um, from members of the public just to make sure we are aligning our service with, with their needs and their demands. Um, and finally, the passengers can book by app, booking website um, or by call centre. And our trips can be booked from three minutes in advance all the way up to 30 minutes in advance. Um, so if we could just move on to the next slide. Um, so 
Prior to the implementation of DRT, um, we had substantial areas within North and East Hertfordshire which faced several transport related challenges for residents who were living in the rural areas. And social exclusion of residents living in these areas who had limited or no access to a car or public transport was one of the key issues that we identified in our local transport plan. Um, and it was also identified in our rural transport plan that most of the focus area, as you can see on the map here, um, were facing accessibility issues that were preventing socially disadvantaged um, residents from reaching employment, education, healthcare services um, and food shopping. And many residents who live in the scheme area um, were poorly served by existing local bus services um, and there were actually 10 villages in the operating zone uh, that were not served at all by a timetabled bus service and this accounted for a population of just over 4,000 people. Um, Northern and eastern portions of the DRT zone had limited access to town centres via public transport and many of these destinations require bus journeys of more than one hour at peak times. Um, so this made it difficult for residents to use the bus services for regular journeys, whether that's for commuting needs um, or shopping, let alone for social purposes. Um, and furthermore, significant shares of rural residents didn't have access to a car. So residents who don't have access to private cars nor public transport um, are reliant on rides from friends or family um, or just avoided travel altogether, which was an outcome that contributes to social isolation. Um, so I'll just hand over to James, who I think is going to go through the next few slides. Yeah, thanks, Alice. So as we'll show on the, on the next slide there, based on what Alice has, has just mentioned, this is kind of the data that, that supports that. So we've got here a map um, showing the, the sort of the differential between uh, car ownership and the accessibility to, to transport stops. And you can see there, you know, the sort of key hub towns of, sort of Baldock, Letchworth, Hitchin and Stevenage all the way sort of around this sort of um, southern arc and then to Bishop Stortford are pretty well served with um, bus stops and also the patchwork quilt um, approach is, is showing that the car ownership there is, is quite low. However, if you look sort of in the middle there, the, the gap between sort of Baldock and Royston, Royston down to Buntingford and then um, east to, towards Stansted, we see the same correlation in that the further you get from an urban centre, the darker the red, the higher the public transport ownership. And the number of uh, existing um, bus stops is, is really quite low. There's sort of a dozen in the whole area that we are looking to, to, to cover with uh, Hearts Links. And so we saw this as a, a really sort of good opportunity, as Alice mentioned, to address not just all the issues about rural isolation and transport access, but also trying to look at see how habits can be changed and what can be done in this area. And the results are pretty um, exciting. If we jump to the next slide, you can see how we've managed to enable new levels of access to public transport in an area where bus provision was not present. And we've got here two separate images. The image on the right is pre Hearts Links, and the, uh, sorry, the image on the left is pre Hearts Links. The image on the right is now with Hearts Links. And we're looking at the access to a bus stop within a five, ten, and fifteen minute walk. So something that you know, a five minute walk we tend to see as um, pretty feasible. Um, from uh, adoption of a DRT service and 10 minutes and 15 minutes is that sort of stretch target that people are willing to do once in a while and they're willing to do it more if they do it once or twice and have a successful experience and you can see there on the left before that entire hearts link zone um, that Alice just described is sort of non-existent in terms of its access to public transport but what we've been able to do since you can see now that sort of area between sort of Stevenage and, uh, and Royston is, is now really well covered um, through to Bundingford as well, and also east of that towards Bishop Stortford and Stansted. So it's amazing how you can take um, a more flexible service that really you know, operates in a slightly different manner to um, the fixed line, but actually we're seeing a lot more deeper uh, connections where people in much more rural and isolated communities, those 4,000 people that Alice mentioned, are now able to access uh, a community service or a you know, commercial bus service they were unable to previously. And so if we just jump uh, forward to understand why is it so key to Hertfordshire, it's improved access in terms of how we tackle social, uh, social inclusion and make sure that people don't longer feel isolated. I know there was um, funds last year released uh, by the DFT for uh, sort of rural mobility hardship and those sorts of things. And Hearts Link is sort of a living, breathing example that we can tackle 
um, and achieve that. But also we can talk about, you know, it's difficult to operate a bus service in a cost-effective manner between areas that are so geographically dispersed and, you know, commercial services just by their nature and how they exist do not tend to operate um, far from a primary network primary road network because the patch would be low and a bus service may seen may be seen as uh, financially unviable but actually DRT um, through the support of the RMF has been able to um, reach and attract uh, these passengers and take them onto you know other parts of a public transport network whether that's train whether that's bus and it means that you know by providing a service that gets someone from one of those isolated communities and they can get a journey to Bishop Stortford Railway Station or Stevenage Railway Station, it's given them a new connection uh, to a rail hub and it's removing um, that dependence on a private car to make sure that they have an alternative method and encouraging, like I mentioned before, that multimodal uh, journey life cycle. So what are we able to achieve? Well, let's talk about some of the results and how successful we are feeling the service has grown um, in the last time. Students are now able to use the service for college trips. It's one of the top three uh, most popular destinations, um, one of the colleges in the area. And that's something where we can't say for certain that those were um, previously all single private car journeys. But due to the nature of the, the school run and how um, parents often drop off their kids, we can say with a pretty high degree of certainty that these journeys are removing single occupancy car journeys from the road and converting people uh, to a DRT service. Workers, commuters, they're now using the service in a multimodal way. They're connecting with onward uh, trains. So 12% of our pickups and 21% of our drop-offs are serving um, bus or train interchanges within the area. And the off-peak journeys, the trips to um, you know, the shops, trips to the cinema, uh, hospital appointments, these are all growing in popularity. And the disparance between uh, you know, a very high-use um, peak journey and some off-peak travel where that perhaps drops a bit is, is nothing new to public transport, and it's something that Alice and her team are, have been working well to sort of grow as a segment. And in terms of what we mentioned before, both on that, map of the isochromes and the map showing the bus stops and relative um, density of car ownership, you can see here how on the right, our existing operating zone with the key hub towns corresponds to the existing fixed line service provision within the area. You have the purple hub towns where, you know, here on the outskirts of the circle, there's a pretty good level of bus service in, in Stevenage, in Bishop Stortford, in Letchworth, et cetera. But actually, through the heart of the zone where these 4,000 communities are, are isolated and also where there wasn't so much before, these services are running every two hours, every three hours, maybe only three or four days a week. So that's been our core target from the beginning to make sure that these people now have access to something that they didn't previously have. So I think on the next slide, we'll also talk about the makeup of the service. DRT is often questioned in terms of, is it just concessionary pass users? How do you attract the users? I think Alice had a really positive experience in terms of how people are using it, how they've been feeding back and what they're doing to grow uh, their service usage. Yeah, thanks, James. So as part of our monitoring and evaluation process, we often review the breakdown of booking types. Um, and our initial thoughts for the service was, was that it was primarily going to be a, a slightly um, increased dialer ride service where we would see a higher percentage of concessionary pass users using the service um, but actually contrary to our initial thoughts um, our percentage of passengers using the concessionary passes is actually quite low um, and sits at about 10 percent and on the other hand where we thought actually ridership from students would be low um, we've actually been able to sustain a fairly high percentage of students using the service um, to access places of education using their saver card discount of 50 percent so just for context, a saver card is a discount scheme for people aged between 11 and 25 who can purchase a saver card and then return and um, benefit from 50% off bus travel. And so this has been quite interesting learning for us um, and has also helped us steer our target marketing throughout the school and college breaks um, where we had actually noticed a bit of a trend um, of decline in patronage, um, especially in our first summer holidays where we had six weeks with no, no students using the service. So um, it, it's been really important for us to look at this uh, on a regular basis just to kind of see uh, that breakdown of who's using the service. Um, 
And also just to briefly touch on the breakdown of the booking channels that are used as well, um, we can see that the bookings are predominantly placed via the HeartSync's booking app, which is what we expected. Um, and 15% of them are booked by the website and only 5% um, of users book via the call center. Um, but while 5% is low, um, we really value the option to have a telephone line as well uh, because it just ensures that the HeartSync service remains accessible to all residents, um, especially those who may not have access to technology. And um, so I think we're going to move forward now to looking at our dial ride service um, and why we look to digitalize our dial ride service um, in the first place. So dial ride as a service has been operating in Hertfordshire for a long time. Um, and, it, and it's maintained a really key role in providing transport links to residents who are either over the age of 75 um, or registered with a permanent disability um, and who may otherwise struggle to get appointments um, or, or shopping, et cetera. Um, and whilst the service has remained functional, historically, it's not been given the opportunity to become an attractive service. Um, and this is primarily due to budget constraints um, and use of a manually a manual scheduling system. So pre-digitalization, dial ride bookings were closed a week in advance um, to allow for the operational team to plan routes, um, allocate bookings to vehicles, uh, and this was a really long manual process. So um, we decided to rebrand and digitalize the service by implementing the same technology um, that we use on Hearts Links um, and open the booking system up with a passenger app a booking website, a driver app, and a management interface. Um, and then on top of this, we also rebranded the vehicles to fit this new refreshed dial ride um, but I'll come on to that a bit later on. So the next slide shows, um, and we'll talk about what the benefits are for the users um, from this digitalization. So as I've just mentioned, um, the digitalization opens up the possibilities of different booking channels for dial -Ride members, uh, which actually gives these individuals that independence and freedom to plan their own journeys. And it also opens up the possibilities um, of almost on-demand trips, as users can now book on the same day, uh, subject to availability, of course. Um, so it really does become a much more flexible service overall. And I think it's also important to note that the implementation of the DRT technology also benefits the families or the carers of some of the most vulnerable members that are transported on the service, um, as they can see the bookings that are made on the app um, or the website, and they can actually see when the vehicle is on the way to them uh, to pick up their, their family member. Um, and also, well, either for an individual or for a, a family member or a carer, having an accurate pickup time shown in a text or on the app is such a valuable improvement as it really mitigates the need to kind of wait around for potentially a long time for their pickup. So pre-technology implementation, dial -a ride pickups were given a time window, which sometimes could actually be in excess of an hour, um, whereas now the pickup is visible, albeit with a small window of flexibility, a uh, maximum of about 10, 12 minutes. Um, and it really puts the individuals back in control of their own time. Um, and similarly, by implementing DRT technology, onto the service, it becomes a much more attractive way for younger people to book their journeys and gain their independence as well. Over the last few years, only one of our dial -Ride members was actually under the age of 30. And we know that there are groups of younger disabled people who actually are at risk of social isolation. So therefore, by moving the visual identity of the service towards a sleeker um, and more modern brand and the implementation of the DRT technology, um, we're hopeful that this will encourage younger people to use the service without worrying about that kind of stereotypical connotation of the traditional dial ride service. Um, so if we could just move forward and we'll talk about change management. Um, so as with all projects, initiating a change, um, there's always going to be a number of lessons that have to be learned throughout the transition. Um, and as touched on before, pre-digitalization, um, the operational team were primarily using pen and paper to plan routes. Um, and actually either faxing or texting over the schedules to the drivers, um, which was incredibly time consuming for everybody involved. Um, but this had been the process for a large number of years. So the transition to this new technology was always going to require a period of re-education for everybody involved, um, but especially for the operational team and the drivers. And it's been a learning curve over the last six months of transition. Um, but overall, the teams understand the benefits of the implementation of the technology and how it really does improve the service for the members. 
Um, but it's also required the dialogue members themselves to be re-educated to. Um, I think the regular users were used to the old way of phoning up to book in advance, and they were actually quite afraid of what these changes might mean for them. So it was really important for us to ensure that the members saw this um, change in a positive way. So we emphasised, you know, they, they can still book in exactly the same way. They can still speak to the same coordinator on the phone. Um, and, you know, in most cases, they'll actually still be picked up by their regular driver. Um, and really kind of driving that message in that nothing would be adversely affected by this transition. Um, and that was done by a series of communications, along with roadshow events um, and setting up specific contact channels for, for any Dialide member who wanted just to talk through their concerns. Um, but overall, though, considering such a vast change was implemented across the whole county, um, it, it has been a success. Um, so I think I just need to hand over to James for the next slide. There we go. Um, what, do we, what do we mean when we're modernising it? Um, Alice has talked through the change management approach and what that means uh, for the end user, but what does that mean sort of behind the scenes uh, with our work, both on our platform and also what we were working through with Hubshire um, to do. So a large volume of dollar ride journeys, as, as Alice mentioned, they repeat, they are recurring journeys. People go to the same place at the same time, probably every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. And around 80% of um, these users are to day centers, social clubs, uh, respite areas, et cetera. And a, large number of these, given that they're 80%, need to be designed in a slightly different way to how we talked about uh, for the Hearts Links regular DRT service. So what we had to do was um, look at the, the models we have, whether that's free floating and whether that's feeder. And given that such a high volume were on repeat journeys and such a small amount using the, the ad hoc journeys, we had to sort of rethink how we uh, look to implement a service design. So what we have done is, um, implemented a series of feeder services for the vehicles. So they take uh, sort of a route from the earliest uh, possible pickup at a fixed time for the destination. So if they have to be at a day center, for example, by 10.30, we sort of put in a hard cutoff um, for say the vehicle will arrive at the latest at 10.25. Um, and I saw a couple of people asking in the chat how we guarantee that. So at the point of booking, the way we guarantee that is we provide users with the earliest possible pick up time for their journey that might be 7 a.m and they might have the latest possible drop off at 7 30 and those two times are fixed they will not be picked up earlier than 7 a.m and then it will not be dropped off later than 7 30 and that 30 minute window built into that is some time to include whether or not they'll be picking up additional passengers which will maybe push the uh, pick up uh, back slightly but regardless of the number of passengers that are picked up on the way, that 7.30 drop-off remains the hard, uh, fixed and locked-in target. So what we do is we have these um, sort of locked-in uh, drop-off times for a series of feeder services that operate across the vehicles, and they typically do this in the morning and uh, the afternoon to take people to the day centre or social club that they're going to, and at sort of two or three o'clock, we just operate that in reverse. And that then gives us a window between sort of 10.30 uh, and 2 p.m. where we put the vehicles into a free floating manner. So rather than doing sort of the fixed arrival um, at a certain place at a given time, we can take it to a more uh, DRT aspect. And that's where we typically see the journeys um, serving um, people for um, maybe lighter hospital trips that are non-urgent um, and also things like going to the shops or going to see friends or family. So that's how we modernized it. I think we're gonna talk now um, on the next slide about how we give them both their marketing um, approach. The services are very different in terms of what they want to achieve and who they're targeting, as Alice mentioned. But actually, um, as we see on the following slide, there are some similarities in some ways. So we've had to try and work out how we align both the DRT approach and the data ride services. So on the left here, DRT services, we think them being driven by digital adoption. We have a much um, higher uptake rate um, for the um, services. And Alice mentioned for, for dial -a ride one user uh, under the age of 30 that they look to grow. And DRT is often seen as something new, something innovative uh, and highly flexible. But the key um, learning point here is the service that we had when we first launched uh, in 2021 with Hearts Links versus the service that operates now 
it, it's quite different in terms of how it is behind the scenes. We make lots of iterative changes. And, you know, if Alice and her team think we can make something um, a little bit better, we can have that discussion at um, 10 a.m. on a Tuesday. And by midday on the Tuesday, two hours later, that's implemented. And people, you know, the, the end user doesn't see directly how those changes are made, but indirectly through how they're taking their journeys and the improvements, that's how they're seen. And DRT can often be a stepping stone. Um, as we mentioned right at the, at the top of the webinar, there's sometimes uh, some barriers, some digital barriers or just some service barriers and, and perception barriers um, to using, uh, for example, the bus. And so DRT can be a stepping stone for public transport for people who perhaps didn't want to use it and had those barriers up. And if they have a positive experience on um, the HeartSync service, the hope then is that they transition to taking uh, multimodal journeys so that they then take the DRT and then take the bus or take the DRT and then take the train. But conversely, if we think about dial -a ride as we mentioned, that 80% um, of bookings from a recurring regular user base, those are traditionally focused. Um, dial -a ride has always been focusing on those core group of users with a rather more limited um, level of, of digitalization and also quite a limited um, definition of, of service parameters. I think we see dial -a ride generally across um, England, certainly the, the parameters sort of, well, we will guarantee that we'll pick you up between, for example, 8 and 8.30, you'll be on the vehicle probably no longer than an hour and we'll just get you where you need to be at the time um, that you would like. So that's quite a loose um, definition of a service design and we've tried to bring some um, sort of structure and a certain level of rigidity to that so that people understand quite, you know, when they're going to be picked up and that 7 to 7.30 window that I touched upon earlier so that then, you know, given that, as I was mentioned, there's been that struggle to grow and attract new user base, but providing these sort of, you know, wider principles that have a bit more structure, we can help grow and go forward um, with that service to ensure that we, you know, grow it beyond its existing user base and demographic to attract hopefully a younger um, demographic as well. And so if we just jump um, forward to the next slide, we'll talk about how we've made a single brand for both the DRT and the Dalarai services. So um, you can see the, the HeartSync services in that um, now rather iconic uh, black and green livery. And then also at the bottom there, the Dalarai uh, brand renewal, where I think if you took um, 100 people and asked them what they think of Dalarai, it would probably perhaps more the image on the left and how we've now brought it up um, to that black and green uh, approach as well. And I think Alice has had some real success in terms of how now dial -a ride is perceived um, in the public uh, eye, rather than being always that sort of, you know, legacy white and green approach. Yeah, thanks, James. Um, so as, as James said, we decided to rebrand the dial -a ride service so that they aligned closely with the HeartsLinks brand. Um, and that really recognisable colour scheme uh, as mentioned of the green and black, which is kind of, you know, recognisable county wide now, not just in North and East Hearts where HeartSynchs operates at the moment. However, um, we still wanted to maintain that individuality of the dial -a ride service um, as, as it really does play an important role in transporting some of our most vulnerable residents. Um, and it is a more bespoke service than HeartSynchs um, with that kind of door to door aspect. Um, so, so keeping that slight differentiation was really key. Um, but we do have uh, the sticker of in partnership with Hearts Links um, on every vehicle, um, but we, we allow the dial ride brand to remain predominant. Um, and we also decided to refresh the dial ride logo to reflect the modernization of the service um, and the digitalization of the booking system, uh, moving away from that notion that you could only really book by phone, um, which is perhaps what the previous slightly dated logo um, inferred. Um, and as I've mentioned before, um, it's also anticipated that the rebranding of this service will make it a more attractive um, service um, and more appealing for younger residents um, who do fit the eligibility criteria of membership as well. Um, and as a positive experience of the rebranding, um, we've actually used one of our rebranded dial ride vehicles um, on our HeartSync service as a temporary replacement vehicle. We had absolutely no negative feedback from passengers at all um, about this. Um, and whilst our dial ride vehicles are not quite the same luxury specification um, as the standard fleet we use for Hearts Links, passengers could still identify um, with the green and black branding, which is really positive, um, especially as we look towards potential integration of, of both services in the future. Um, so if we can just move ahead to the next, thank you. 
Um, so just to look at dialeride and DRT uh, trip types and, and how they're shared, um, they both they both share the same core principle and their objective as a service, which is to provide these crucial transport links for residents um, who otherwise would have had to rely on private car use, uh, family or friends, um, as public transport is either sparse or wholly not available to them. Um, and therefore they're at risk of social isolation. And this is really shown in the correlation um, of the trip types for each service. So we see on DRT, for example, a large number of passengers using the service to connect with other existing transport hubs, such as rail or fixed line bus services. Um, and as discussed, we see non-entitled students using Heartlinks to reach schools or colleges where they would otherwise have relied on a parent or carer to bring them in. Um, but with Dialeride, we see that the vast majority of trips taking passengers um, into, into key hubs where they'll attend day services or social clubs. Um, and I, do, I should note here actually that we do see less ad hoc bookings on Dialeride um, in comparison to DRT, but we are looking at ways um, of how to promote this. Um, but with both services, we see that single occupancy car usage is being reduced. Um, as passengers are able to trust and depend on these services that provide the journey instead of reliance on their own cars um, or a family member or a carer or friend or taxi. Um, so if we could just move forward to kind of where are we going to next? Um, so the key principle for our next steps will be the utilization of our fleets to provide a more holistic transport approach within Hertfordshire. Um, and this will require analyzing trip demand data, both from DRT and Dialeride services, um, especially now that we have such uh, access to a wealth of data for Dialeride uh, with the implementation of the new technology, um, and identifying any downtime, which we could then use to support the other services. So predominantly, we're looking at this um, in the case of Dialeride supporting DRT journeys. Um, for example, reviewing the period of parking or downtime for the Dialeride vehicles um, and understanding the peaks and troughs of demand especially looking at those who are using the service more casually rather than those feeder services for members who attend uh, centres or clubs. And by doing this, we can look at whether the Dialeride vehicle can actually be used to support the demand for DRT journeys um, throughout these quieter periods. But we need to have at least six months of operational data behind us before we can start to draw any conclusions. Um, but it draws back to having the alignment of the branding, which allow us to use the service in a more flexible way. Um, and taking this one step further, one of our next projects is actually um, fu well funded by the Bus Service Improvement uh, Plan Mechanism. Um, we'll be integrating a couple of community transport schemes into the DRT network as well. And this will be for small periods throughout the day, um, just to help plug the gaps in some of the um, fixed bus line networks. And we'll be working closely with PADAM on this as well as it's going to be operated under the Heartslinks branding and booking mechanisms. Um, and lastly, I just really wanted to kind of quickly touch on uh, the Heartslinks expansions. Um, so these are also under BSIP funding from the DFT. Um, so as mentioned, our evening service launched in April this year, which provides that additional service um, for residents who don't work the typical nine to five, um, or perhaps have an evening appointment, um, or just want to socialize a bit longer in the evenings. Um, and our second expansion is for the current Hearts Links to expand to Hartford and Ware, increasing our operational zone um, and the implementation of an additional two vehicles into this area. Um, and then our final expansion will be the implementation of a brand new DRT service, um, still under Hearts Links, of course, uh, but this will be a, a separate entity in Decorum, so in West Hertfordshire, where we'll have three vehicles operating and providing the links for rural residents again, um, into the towns where they can feed into other existing transport networks. Um, and it's anticipated that both of these new um, expansions will have launched by October this year. Um, so overall, we've got quite a clear roadmap for our services, um, especially for the next three years or so. Um, and we are looking forward to see how this can benefit the residents of Hertfordshire even further. Um, so thank you. I think that's it from me. But James, is there anything else you want to add? No, that's everything. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Alice, for adding that. I think, as you can see, everyone who's watching, hopefully we, you can see how we've taken this journey uh, with Alice and, and the wider Hertfordshire team to go from, you know, that additional uh, first initial RMF trial to looking at how it may be explored to, to Dialeride and then building, as Alice mentioned at the end there, 
we've seen a lot of success with the with the Hearts Links um, as it is today, and we're really excited as we go through towards the end of the year what that's going to do and how that's going to open up more um, of Hertfordshire people to to try the new service. Right, thanks very much, James and Alice. Um, really interesting uh, to understand um, how those two services are working um, and um, providing benefits for residents. Um, perhaps if we can drop the slides now so we can see everybody and then we'll go through some questions. Um, so there's lots of questions in the Q&A um, and I've also got questions that were submitted before. Um, so I'm going to start with the first one of these. Um, and the first one is to do with fares. So I wonder if um, either of you can tell us a little bit more about the fares that are charged on the DRT service. Um, and there's a supplementary question, which is regarding the, uh, the two pounds fare and whether there's um, been any stats on that. Um, that'd be great, thank you. Yeah, thanks, I'm, I'm happy to answer that one. Um, so we initially designed our fares to kind of fit in between in that middle ground of uh, cheaper than a taxi, but more expensive than a traditional bus service. Um, so our, our fares uh, at the beginning um, were slightly cheaper with the incentive, new service, things like that. But um, at the moment, pre two pound fare cap, um, our fares range between three pounds and six pounds. So uh, naught to two miles was three pounds. And then it was kind of sequentially increasing up until you get to anything over 10 miles, which was six pounds. Um, so and it's still still you know good value um and the two pound fare cap obviously has been has been a great incentive um for everybody to get back out onto bus travel um and we did see an increase um of patronage uh, for the first couple of months um we have noticed that um in april we had a, a slightly uh lower uh, patronage level however we think that is almost aligning with that easter break again kind of referring back to we do have such a high usage of students um, using the service so we're kind of aligning aligning that dip with them but overall the two pound fare cap has has proved a uh, positive for our patronage on the service that's great thank you um anything to add on that one james um not, not particularly I, I would say that broadly across the other services we have in the uk that opted in for that two pound fare cap like i spent you see a bit of growth in january and maybe stable through the other months um but nothing you know we haven't seen a huge big bang um as the cap came in oh, that's great um so some questions from which are submitted before the uh the session um and they, these are kind of a few questions grouped under the the heading success so um i wonder if you could um talk a little bit about what you think success looks like when delivering bus services for rural communities um and the question there is th or thinking about sort of waiting times and, and cost definitely i'll um, I'll take this one first and I'll ask if, you, if you want to add anything. So I think, think success in, in the first instance is that it's now a service that is used, that, that this is an area that where there was no service provision before. And now we have, you know, a secure uh, and stable group of customers regularly using the service. And I think when we're looking at how we successfully deliver that, we're increasing the accessibility to public transport and we're using uh, virtual stops. So, you know, from that aspect, the access is there and the success is being delivered because people are able, are able to access something that is through a virtual piece of infrastructure rather than sort of physical bus infrastructure. So it's success, not just in how people are using the service, but success for the model that people understand that they can go to, you know, number 20 Hertfordshire Drive and there's a bus stop and they understand that they can do that rather than it being, you know, a physical um, bus pole. And um, I think we need to think, more longer term in waiting times, as we mentioned, it's a very large area of Hertfordshire that's being covered um, with a relatively small um, fleet availability. But what we look at, and Alice I'm sure can touch on, on the waiting times, but we're seeing sort of the longer journeys of sort of 10 to 12 kilometers, people taking journeys of 20, 25 minutes. And I think these are journeys that are not possible by bus, another um, success. And we just need to think to be a bit more, um, careful in terms of the cost implications, like Alice mentioned, finding that sweet um, point between cheaper than taxi, a little, uh, little bit more than a bus, and look to see how that fare structure develops, not just this year, but the, the following three years as well. That's great. Anything to add on that one, Alice? Yeah, I, I think, uh, which I, I agree with everything that, that James has just said there, but I think um, for, for us, it's kind of, yes, you know, you can, you can 
align your statistics and your data with kind of what KPIs you set out at the beginning of your service. Um, but also looking at it from, you know, a social point of view, um, success is re removing or mitigating the risk of social isolation for these residents who otherwise just, like I said before, had to rely on that private car usage or friends and families um, and providing that that kind of um, individual freedom um, to be able to access these these places that otherwise they just potentially may have just sat at home. Um, so I think we really need to be, uh, consider that as a success as well, on top of obviously the, the data led KPIs, etc. Thanks very much. So I've got a question here, which is um, regarding how these, what you've done in Hertfordshire can be replicated in other areas. So to what extent do you think you have um, any unique characteristics, um, either um, yourselves or your, or your partners, uh, or indeed the geography, that make what you've done unique? Or do you think this is something that can be readily replicated um, in other locations? Um, I think I think for us the reason the reason why the um, north and Ar north and east hearts service has has been a success is because we were able to implement DRT in an area where there really just wasn't much um, in, in the in the form of other existing transport services. Um, so you know for residents it was kind of wow this is something this is something new and it's I can use it and 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 I can get to where I want to go on public transport whereas before they probably had nothing. Um, so we we were not lucky, but we were able to utilize that that kind of gap in the market um, for this service. And then the natural development of that, we then see people who um, are perhaps wanting to do different journeys that they wouldn't have otherwise considered, uh, things like that. So I think the, the real test will be for us is, is re-implementing a new service in the west of the county where the, the makeup is, is different um, than it is to North and East Hearts, uh, but the core principles of the service are going to remain the same. And I think success is um, in our area is making sure that we are feeding our these residents into other towns and, and hubs where they can continue their journey journeys on existing fixed networks, train stations, bus services, air bus stations, things like that. So it's that it's that allowance of connectivity um, with other services that I, I, I feel really makes it a success. Right. Um, and I've, we've got some questions about connectivity with with uh, rail and so on, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, so a couple of um, kind of practical questions, which um, maybe James can start, start, start with first, um, is to do with the difference in booking um, a corner to corner service rather than a door to door service and how that works um, across um, both the dialer ride and the, the flex service. So um, what the customer experience is like and whether whether people are, are where, where people are picked up from. <laughs> Sure. So I'll start with the door-to-door. -door. Um, it is it is it is what it says uh, on the tin. So for the dialer ride, it's it's door-to-door, -door, but perhaps a little bit more as well. So these are people, um, the drivers have specific training and also the users are uh, people with specific mobility needs. So the driver will go to their door and help them board the vehicle. And in terms of how we set that up as a service, we will uh, assign a certain sort of dwell time for that user. So for me, if I have a limited level of uh, ambulant ability, I might be sort of two or three minutes, um, whereas someone else may be sort of 10 minutes if they're in a, a wheelchair and need to be loaded onto the vehicle as such. And how that differs to the Heartlink service um, being DRT and corner to corner, people are picked up at virtual stops. So that, as I mentioned um, before, no sort of visible um, infrastructure to say that you're there other than the address that you're provided at the point of booking and that is people are expected to board and alight the vehicle of their own accord and for that the dwell time is probably sort of 20 or 30 seconds to get on and off mm -hmm. um, in that aspect. Great thanks very much. So um, question about sort of integrating to other modes so um, this is I think you touched on this a little bit about people being feeding into uh, rail services, uh, but I think there's also uh, whether people are actually feeding into main bus services as well. So I wonder if you could comment on um, the extent to which you think people are are interchanging to other to other modes, and then how you can uh, kind of kind of deal with that. So for example, if someone's got to catch a train, and the train comes, um, you know, every half an hour or so, and um, how do you make sure uh, that, that that connection is reliable? Sure. So the first one, it's, um, you know, it's, a, it's an assumption that we make when we see people traveling to bus interchanges, um, that, you know, for example, in Stevenage bus interchange, there's a lot of um, high frequency bus services. So we know 
with a level of certainty that they are likely to be interchanging. Um, and on the second point for the, the trains every half an hour, that's a bit where similar to the feeder services we're using on the dialer ride to get people to the day centre or social club by 10 a.m., we would look to say, okay, the latest that the vehicle can arrive at train station X, if the train is leaving every half an hour, is 25 past the hour. And that gives enough time for the vehicle to arrive, five minutes for people to get off, get their ticket, et cetera, and then get on the train uh, in that way. Great, that's, that's great. Um, so I now have a few questions regarding funding. Um, and so, Alice, you mentioned a number of pots of, of government funding that have been accessed to, to help uh, implement this. Um, so th the question is quite blunt, I'm afraid. Uh, do you have a long term strategy to fund DRT services? It's an excellent question and one that we are uh, currently considering every, every single day, actually. Um, so DRT. It, we, we don't anticipate it's ever going to wash its face as such. Um, it's always going to require some form of funding from somewhere. Um, and obviously, at the moment, we're able to utilise the Royal Mobility funding, um, but that, that's kind of got a, a cliff edge um, at, the end, at the end of the funding period. Um, so what we're currently trying to do is look at how can we bridge that gap to make sure that we can actually continue um, our DRT service post RMF funding. Um, now, I know we have got some BSIP funding for our expansions, but they won't cover the ongoing costs for the existing service that we have today. Um, so a couple of strategies that we've already implemented um, is starting to looking at layering the service with um, other services so that we can kind of generate some additional revenue um, whilst, you know, supporting other services within the council, for example. Um, so we do a couple of home to school routes um, on two of our vehicles morning and afternoon. Um, whilst that obviously means two vehicles are outside uh, are not accessible for members of public at this time, um, it means that we're able to kind of, like I say, bring in a bit more revenue for us. It's, it's a cheaper way for um, other departments in the council to put on home to school transport. Um, and um, it also, you know, then the students who are using it may feel actually, you know, what, this is a great service. I'll use this in my free time as well as using it when I'm on the, the home to school route. Um, so we're Again, with layering, it's a fine line because you don't want to layer so much that actually you remove DRT and it just becomes, you know, some kind of shuttle service that is kind of doing so many different um, fixed line services that it's not a DRT service anymore. So it is that, that balance of finding the right mixture. Um, but it, it's really important to make sure that our service is sustainable moving forward. Um, so also looking at uh, Section 106, so contribution from developers, uh, things like that, and also potential um, integrations with um, external um, synergies with, with companies, for example. Um, so my team at the moment are looking at partnerships with local football clubs and things like that, where we can kind of get some contributions from them, but providing the service in return um, just to kind of, like I say, help help bridge the gap. Um, so that, that's our plan at the moment. Thanks, Mary. Uh, lots of things going on there. So, um, yeah, it sounds like a, you've, you've got some really good uh, things in progress there. Uh, James, is there anything that you want to add in terms of experience um, um, sort of on these services in other locations or other other countries with regards to funding? Um, yeah, I would say that funding, obviously, a lot of services and DRT in particular will require, to some extent, always a level of funding. And I think the, the bigger sort of the to flip the question on its head is to think about DRT being commercially viable and thinking, does that mean DRT has to be profitable um, or does it need just to be, as Alice mentioned, how do we make it sustainable for the future? And one way to do that, as Alice mentioned, is interworking the pots of money, having the stuff doing school services or, um, as you mentioned, the, the football club to make sure that services can exist. But as we've seen, you know, in the UK and in my experience, some services abroad, you know, 8 till 8 a.m to 5 p.m they do something and then you know corporate stuff from 6 p.m onwards where the the price barrier is a little bit higher because it's being used in a private manner and that sort of offsets any of the subsidy that you may need to run it sort of during the daytime so to speak thanks very much um so i've got a couple of uh, questions which are um looking at uh, digital connectivity and or actually the reverse. So th the first one is, um, I wonder if you can talk through a little bit about um, how people who don't have access to digital services, apps, and websites can access um, either of the services. 
Um, and the second one is actually almost the other way is, um, is information about your DRT services being shared to journey planners such as Google to allow a, a wider group of maybe more digital natives to uh, be aware of the service. Um, I don't know who I should go to first on that. Either. Open to either of you. Uh, uh, yep, yeah, I'll, I'll take that one um, first. So on the first point for, for non-digital um, natives to, to use the service. So essentially there's, there's two differences between how you book. If you book through our mobile app, you will receive the journey updates um, and any changes via push notifications. Um, and you just accept that like you would and you authorize the notifications when you, when you sign up for the service. And then if you book through the web booking website or you ring up through the call center, that's another way we address um, that digital barrier. You will receive um, an SMS um, notification to your mobile phone. I think, of course, we understand that particularly for the dialer ride users, if someone's elderly, if they're in their 90s, they perhaps don't even have a mobile phone. And the sort of, sort of option that they often have is the carer, whether that's um, a, a private care or it's a family member signs up and books on their behalf and then the number associated to receive those sms uh, updates is you know the son daughter uh, whatever and often they are living with that person so they can share the journey updates um, as well and then for the second part in terms of how we can display um and make awareness of of, of drt services through things like google um that's something that's a continual topic it's a it's something that doesn't happen um, today, um, I think it's something that we would all like both for um, regular DRT services, but services also provided by community transport operators um, to try and ensure that the visibility, you know, that's a, it's a great marketing tool if, you know, you go on Google and you want to get from Bishop Stortford to Stevenage and as well as the train and the drive, it pops and says, oh, you can book a, um, a Hearts Links and it will cost you X amount and take 50 minutes. But I think that's probably something that when we talk about mobility as a service and integration with journey plans is probably something that's maybe still a few years down the line, despite um, us being sort of eager and ready to get that started. Um, when we've spoken to some people at Google, the, there's a bit more limitation from their side and that they're sort of more apprehensive, I think, about integrating. Yeah, I think I, I was proved to one of these conversations where maybe someone like a Google think, that they've got bigger fish to fry at this stage and maybe you know uh show the demand or they might consider uh, that sort of thing so yeah yeah exactly i think maybe google viewer is a bit too niche um mm -hmm. and not in the us but obviously in the uk it's very very relevant yeah thanks um so a couple of questions here from the audience about um understanding demand um so the first one is um, as to whether you understand if there's any suppressed demand. So that's effectively um, you know, people who maybe are looking uh, but aren't able to book or, or don't book it. Um, um, if you can see who, who, who maybe the, because the rides are all taken. And the other one, I don't know whether you, you share these sort of statistics, but the average number of passengers on the DRT service. Sure. So uh, I'll take the first one um, in terms of suppressed demand and uh, Alice talk about sort of patronage. I think there are always going to be um, demand that is not met, um, whether that's any service, but perhaps more so given that the, the size and fleet size of, uh, of the area that Hertfordshire are covering. <clears throat> but I think for us, it's key to understand um, why uh, that demand wasn't met. Was it because there just weren't no um, vehicles in the area and they were being pulled to other parts of the zone um, to cover journeys? Or was it really that the vehicles were, were saturated? And I think it's probably a mixture of the two. In the peak hours when you know people are going to stations and people are going to um, place of education it might be more that we're seeing areas of saturated demand whereas you know in those off-peak times when the vehicles are perhaps more spread out that's where we might see um issues with it and i think then the challenge for us and how we work with with alice is saying okay if i'm requesting a journey for 8 45 or 10 45 for example let's take the 10 45 example and i'm showing something not 10 45 but it's you know 10 past 11 or half past 11 that might not work for me but what we've started to do um, in Hertfordshire and some other places uh, in the UK and Europe is show an option maybe at 20 to 11 or half past 10 and so although they're not getting the exact journey they want we understand that the journeys in advance might not be um, appealing but if we can make them say oh what about if you travel 10-15 minutes earlier that's quite a good way um, of understanding how sort of receptive they are um, but the biggest challenge is always that person who downloads the app, does a search, 
doesn't quite get what they want and then they go silent we can never really understand fully it's very hard to capture that feedback from that user if they then disappear um, and that's something we're always actively trying to to dig deeper into alice I'll, I'll let you talk about the patronage thanks james um yeah so so really i think when, when we first launched we we did see um a lot of trips where we kind of had one passenger on the vehicle um quite often um and what we have seen now is 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 a good increase in our grouping rate um of passengers and we are actually building up where you know you get group group bookings um themselves also grouped with other passengers um who are heading in a similar direction at a similar time um and that's a really positive um increase that, that we've seen and we're now sitting at i think a grouping rate of about 73 percent um which is which is really positive um and our passenger trips per hour has increased um, on average from 1.63 to 1 1.9 um, which considering you've only got four vehicles and actually the fourth vehicle only came into play in November last year um, so so considering the fleet size that we have like James mentioned um, it is, is a positive increase um, in our passenger trip numbers um, and you know overall surpassing 30,000 trips um, in just under two years again is something that that we're really pleased about so we're on the right trajectory um and i think you know if we could turn back time the one thing that i would have changed is perhaps having some additional vehicles um as replacement vehicles from day one um but just because of the the money that we had we didn't have enough money to have replacement vehicles um, but that actually impacts on on that kind of unfulfilled journey rate sometimes where we have a vehicle um, these vehicles are doing about 150 miles per vehicle per day um, so that they're covering a huge area. Um, so, you know, downtime of vehicles has has impacted our unfulfillment rate. Um, but that, yeah, fingers crossed when we get more vehicles in, we'll, we'll see that decrease. Thanks very much. Um, continuing the theme of demand, um, there's a couple of questions here. So um, do you think that um, there are any cases where demand for the Hearts Link service um, might be able to kind of demonstrate a business case for a fixed line to be launched in the future? Uh, it's, it's, it's an interesting question um, and it is something that we've spoken about, you know, internally um, as kind of what would constitute enough demand to um, to implement a, a traditional fixed line service. Um, and a, actually even just kind of drilling it down to um, looking at that kind of uh, pattern of demand, touching back on one of the earlier questions, I know we spoke about kind of um, these, these, how can we feed into you know, bus services, uh, bus stations and train stations and even places of education. And we actually looked at, can we implement, you know, a fixed line service at specific times of the day? Um, but what we what we kind of um, were able to ascertain by looking at this data is that it's too sporadic. So people, yes, they may all be traveling to one specific point, but the times at which they're traveling are across the board because they've got this new flexible approach to transport they didn't have before. So you know, if you were to say, actually, you can only travel at nine or 11 or, you know, an interval of every couple of hours, perhaps that demand just wouldn't be there anymore. So we haven't made that decision to kind of implement even any semi fixed line service on the DRT, just because whilst we've got that demand from from residents, it's not at a time that we can group together to kind of justify um, that implementation yet. Um, but as, as time goes by, I mean, we're still early days, we're still, you know, just coming up to the end of year two so i think it is too soon to tell um, but it's not something that we would you know not consider in the future thanks very much um similar sort of question kind of the 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 discussion between um flexible and fixed routes so do you have um an understanding of what the subsidy per passenger journey is uh compared to to fixed line routes and uh, recognizing that obviously there are you know, social benefits that are provided by the fix, the the, uh, the flexible services in addition sorry could you just repeat to do with the the sub the question is subsidy per passenger levels comparing the 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 flexible to fixed line rural routes yeah i mean I, it all comes down to again that you know running the drt services is much more expensive than running a fixed line service um mm. so it's always going to require a, a higher subsidy per passenger um but again it kind of comes down to what's the best option for that passenger and and can we make sure that we generate enough revenue enough funding to kind of whilst we want to bring that cost per passenger down naturally 
Um, we also don't want to remove that service um, that these passengers are accessing. Um, so I think we're always going to see that that is going to be more expensive for a DRT uh, per passenger than it is for uh, a fixed line service. James, is there anything else you wanted to add on that? Um, just other than that, as you say, it will always have subsidy. And I think in my experience, it's never the level of subsidy required for DRT is, is never the most extreme as some local bus services require. And it's not obviously purely commercial. It's, it's that Goldilocks place in the, in the middle. Thanks very much. Um, so moving to a, a different topic, a uh, number of questions that people have asked uh, prior to the uh, webinar about um, leisure trips. So, and there's a uh, questions about um, kind of trips to national parks, trips to national trust properties. Um, is that something that, I mean, first of all, uh, apologies for lack of intimate knowledge of, of the Hertford, uh, Hertfordshire geography, but are there destinations that, you know, people might want to visit um, that are, I guess, not non, non town centre, non, uh, what, that might be sort of tourist attractions. Um, and I guess, is, is that something that you've explored or is that maybe on, on the list to, to look at next? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. And actually something that we looked at for our kind of marketing, marketing incentives for the summer. So uh, one thing that we did was looked at what local attractions are there for residents. Um, we offered um, children go free, um, especially to kind of help, you know, with cost of living in the, in the summer periods. Um, and they've got six weeks off of children. Where can they go for a day out that's not necessarily a day shopping? Um, so we looked at local businesses. For example, we've got an amazing lavender field uh, farm. So, you know, that's, that's very um, uh, popular with tourism uh, and things like that. So kind of looking at those local attractions um, and how can we provide those trips? And actually, whilst when we look at the flow map of our trends of travel, we do see that natural kind of outlining of people going from rural into town and vice versa. Um, we have seen a really good uptake of passengers traveling from rural to rural, which is great. So people are using it to go to, um, you know, a, a local museum, perhaps, or something like that. And, and we're always open to looking at new locations. Obviously, we don't want to expand our operating zone too much because then we dilute the service we can offer. Um, but any kind of yeah points of interest. And, and actually, we get residents asking us, oh, could you put a stop at the local farm shop, for example? Um, and you know, as long as it's a safe place for us to put a stop, then, then we do it because we want to make sure that we are aligning with their demand. But those local attractions um, and kind of you know, natural spaces um, is something we're really trying to promote our use of the service for. Great. Um, I have a, a sort of question that follows on from that, which is to do with the safety of stopping. So uh, the person asking the question says that um, how do you deal with bus stop safety and accessibility, given that um, there are lots of places with narrow or neglected or indeed, indeed no, no footpaths and busy, fast roads. So I don't know either James or Alice if there's, this is an issue you've come up with and whether you have a, how, how you deal with that sort of thing, because you don't want to, you know, create a safety issue by, uh, you know, your service. Yeah, for, I think just from my side first, I think the, the advantage is that stops can be in a more flexible position than traditional um, public road infrastructure. And from a safety aspect, obviously that means you know, you can't always guarantee a drop curb, for example, for the accessibility point, but we will look to make it uh, where possible. Um, and in terms of um, the safety point, what we can do is if there's a stop um, that works great uh, for six months, but then, you know, there's some roadworks or there's some challenges in the, in the road infrastructure, what we can do is we can just simply turn that stop off and then it's no longer active, people can no longer book for it and we can look and I think actively engage um, the drivers, the, the passengers who use that stop to try and find an alternative. Um, in terms of the neglected footways along busy fast roads, I don't think we would ever be putting um, bus stops there. We would look to find a safe um, and secure point that we could drop off as and when. Um, but I think, Alice, most of your stops, when they get to that point, there is perhaps a, a regular fixed piece of infrastructure that they can use like a normal bus stop where the bus will stop. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, crucially, when we were looking to set up the Hartslink service, the first thing that we did was review all of the existing um, active bus stops, you know, the NAPTAN bus stops that are in place. Um, and how can we um, utilize any bus shelters that they may have? 
um, or what points of um, identity within local areas can we use as a bus stop, a war memorial, for example, or outside the post office. Um, and whilst we want to make sure that we have stops that are accessible for every you know, resident within the area, um, dropping somebody off in the middle of a country lane where there's a ditch either side and there's no road lighting is just not safe. Um, and whilst you know we, we can't go into a full risk assessment for each stop, um, as James has said, you know if we get any feedback that actually something's happened and that stop is no longer safe for somebody to use, we switch it off. And that's the beauty of this technology. It's so it's so instant. You can just switch it off and implement a new stop, and within seconds, it you know it can be active. Um, and we take a lot of feedback from our drivers as well, because obviously, you know, they're, they're the people who are driving the bus, they're dropping people off there, they're pe picking people up from these stops. Um, and they sometimes recommend, actually, it'd be great to have a new stop here, for example. Um, but it, where, where possible, we are trying, we, and we always have tried to kind of make sure that it is in a well-lit area. Um, you know, there's, there's enough space, the vehicle's not taking up the whole road, which is also important, especially in these rural lanes where actually it's kind of one track sometimes. Um, and if a, if a vehicle is stationary for up to 60 seconds waiting for their passenger, we can't have them blocking up the whole road. road. So it's kind of using some, sometimes using common sense, sometimes, you know, using existing infrastructure um, and also kind of the expertise of those um, drivers who, who are on the kind of front line of the service, if you like. Thanks very much. Um, so we've got about 10 minutes left uh, just to conclude. I've got a few uh, questions. These ones are a little bit more on the sort of delivery side. So the uh, question is, um, is your, are your schemes delivered in-house by the council or in partnership with external community transport groups? And if it's the latter, um, how well has that worked if you're working with multiple community transport groups? Um, so our DRT service, the current one that we have, um, we have both, both aspects of the, of the service contracted out. So obviously we work with Pada Mobility for our technology provider, um, and we have a commercial operator um, that operates the service, they provide the drivers, um, they do all the vehicle maintenance, things like that. Um, but we have strategic control and a kind of um, high level operational management of the service. So um, it's kind of two tiered. Um, and um, for Dial-A-Ride, that's an in-house service. So we, we employ the drivers, we have a team, an operational team that do that. Um, but our technology is provided by Pada Mobility. Um, and the second question about community transport schemes, can you just remind me of what that question was, sorry? Yeah, it was it was whether you work with a single community transport operator or, or multiple, and if there's any, you know, whether there's any, any learnings, if it's more, more than one. Yeah, so so working with the community transport schemes is a project that we're, we're currently um, mm. in the setting up phase. So um, we are establishing which providers we're going to be working with for this new project, um, but it will be more than one provider. Um, and it will be that we'll be um, using Padam's technology on their service. So they have access to that technology for their own services. Um, but for a couple of hours during the day, they will be providing DRT journeys, um, which will be bookable through the Hearts Links app. Um, and they, they, will, they will do those journeys on our behalf. Um, but it's too soon to tell because we haven't, we're, we're sure. still in the setting up phase. That makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, so, sort of the next level of question is regarding uh, driver recruitment. So, there's comments that in other parts of England there's a, uh, a driver recruitment shortage, or I guess a lack of, a lack of drivers to recruit. Um, and there's another comment as to whether uh, DRT services require a higher level of uh, staff uh, given the smaller vehicles so is that something that you've, you've experienced across your services in terms of the ability to find suitably qualified drivers um so for our for our hearts link service that's something that the commercial operator they provide the drivers so um I, i'm not really qualified to kind of comment on what their driver recruitment has been like but um as long as the service has kind of been in play we've not had any issues with not having drivers to fulfill shifts um you know obviously there's a, a couple of exceptions where somebody's ill or things like that but on the whole we haven't had a period of downtime where we haven't had enough drivers to to do the service um we have noticed an issue when it comes to recruitment for our dial ride services um but that that's something you know that i think is a, is across the board with, with in-house driver recruitment um but those are the only two services that kind of we we would have oversight of the driver recruitment for sure thanks very much um so there was a question um, touching on your, your point here about um, integrating across wider services and, you know, access to, to, to a greater number of vehicles and using the PADM platform. Um, so there's a comment that um, 
sometimes the health sector can be resistant to uh, to sort of joining in, as it were. Um, and this is sort of thinking about non-emergency patient patient transport. Um, is this something that you have kind of um, experienced, or whether you have any thoughts, either yourself or, or James, about uh, this particular area? I'll leave this one to you, James. <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, from our side, yes, I think. Um, it came up in some discussions uh, in the last month or so that non-emergency non patient transport has a lot of potential to be reviewed and optimised, but, you know, given often how NH NHS trusts are um, constructed and ordered, it can be challenging to find the right people in the room at the right time. But I think there is no reason um, why it can't work. And we have seen some small levels of appetite um, with some of our other clients in the UK to deliver it. It's just a case of managing expectations for what that type of service um, can serve. And obviously, you know, a dialer ride style vehicle can work for people with, you know, maybe ambulant needs or mobility needs like that, but something where people require, you know, specific machinery um, to be discharged from, that's not what the RT is going to, to look for. So I think the discussions we're having are around people who have a relatively basic um, level of mobility need relative to being discharged from hospital and just sort of looking how we can group them all together um, in sort of a feed away where we take them from the hospital to sort of a number of um, homes back within a specific uh, county. And is that um, something you're specifically uh, discussing with in Hertfordshire or is it more of a sort of a general approach that you'd like to do in more generally? Uh, it's definitely a, a general approach, I'm sure. Um, if the discussions happen with Hertfordshire, of course, we'll be happy to entertain those. But I think it's more the more general approach is at the moment, there's a number of NEPT providers, but there's also a lot, lot of um, taxis that offer this service. And it's not just for the discharge, but it's also to take people into hospital. And, you know, I mentioned in the slide deck about how traditionally Dialeride has been, we'll pick you up roughly um, between 7 and 7.30 and we'll just get you where you need to be by 10. But I think from speaking to various providers and authorities for NEPT, it's even more vague than that. It's, OK, you've got an appointment at 2 p.m. Um, you'll be there in time for your appointment. But that could mean they arrive at the door at 8 p.m. and you're there three hours early, or it could mean you have to rush through with five minutes to spare. So there's a lot of scope to sort of, you know, as I mentioned before, provide that sort of rigidity and structure to, to these services with a DRT approach. Great, okay, thanks very much. Uh, so this one is marked as a question for Alice, so I, sh I shall uh, point in your direction. Um, are there any plans to in integrate the Hearts Link and Data Ride service into a one responsive service, given they're now on a common booking platform? And the comment here is that um, West Midlands have recently done this with um, DRT and Data Ride in Coventry. Yeah, great question, and and it's not one that that we haven't already kind of begun to consider. Um, I think the most important thing is to remember that they are separate services and kind of what their main goals are as a service so you know yes you can integrate them and it's something that we are going to start trialing um like i've said before in those periods of downtime where we don't have the booking demand on dial -a ride we can support drt journeys um, with those vehicles and those drivers um, but people who use dial -a ride are using it for a specific reason um, and so we want to make sure that we kind of keep that as that, you know, safe and, and reliable service for these vulnerable me members of the public who want that kind of more bespoke door to door. You know, the driver will help them with their bags to their front door, things like that, that you wouldn't get on the DRT service because it's just a different style of service. Um, and I think, you know, maybe down the line, um, as technologies progress, if there is that option for us to kind of have that flexible approach where, you know, whilst it's got bookings for DRT, it's a DRT service, but then if there's space, a booking could come in and it, it kind of uh, swaps, and, swaps and changes around, then that's something we could look at. But at the moment, we're, we're kind of going to stick to these fixed periods of, we'll do DRT, this period of time, we move on to dial -a ride and then go back, sorry, uh, other way around, dial -a ride then DRT, then dial -a ride um, So we're, we're beginning that slow process of integration, but I think it's something, you know, that will happen over a period of years rather than, um, than sooner than that. Thank you very much. Um, I think I've got time for one last question. So we're going to take uh, a different view on this. Uh, so this is to do with electrification of the fleet. Um, so I'm going to start by asking James a question as to whether um, Pat Adams software allows to plan in uh, thinking about electrification of the fleet. So um, what impact that might have on vehicle availability. 
And then I wonder if Alice could just uh, comment as to whether um, there's been any thought about the electrification of the fleet. You mentioned 150 miles travel per day and uh, whether there are any uh, thoughts or plans uh, to uh, decarbonize the service. Excellent. OK, so I'll start from from our point of view. We are looking at EVs and how we can provide a, a platform that supports that infrastructure. Um, for us, it's a real range of um, approaches that we can take and we're doing a lot of work uh, for example the service we have in Surrey has got some EVs operating at the moment and we're taking some learnings from how that works um, but I think in terms of how we want to design a product that meets that um, feature there's a couple of challenges the first being that DRT by its very nature we don't know exactly how many miles that vehicle will do it could be a really busy day it could be a really quiet day or it could have a lot of journeys where just by the demand it's running sort of 10 miles empty doing a trip running another 10 miles empty and, and that way. And the sort of elephant in the room is seasonality where you know, our, our service in, in Surrey, the sort of range they get on their electric vehicle in winter when they're using windscreen wipers because it's raining, heating because the vehicle doesn't want to get cold, the range can drop 20 or 30%. So we're trying to understand by collating all of that, that learning, what do we have to look at? Do we have to look at seeing how we can restrict the mileage? Do we have to look at, we say, a time difference? And then the aspect about how we can then route the vehicle towards um, charging points and are we going to do it to one that takes two hours or are we going to do the fast charging and give it you know a half an hour blitz so it could then do a bit more. Thanks very much James. Um, Alice you've got one minute to tell us about uh, any thoughts about electrification of the uh, the fleet in Hartford. Yep, so our fifth vehicle that we're implementing onto the service will be an electric vehicle. Um, it is branded up in a, in a slightly more electric way, um, but it, it, it's, it's been an interesting um, road trying to get this electric vehicle into the, into the service, um, especially as James touched upon, you know, that uncertainty of mileage, um, having to keep the vehicle within proximity of a charging point implementation of the infrastructure um, because there's not enough infrastructure for electric buses um, in, in the in, in the area so um, it is something that we're moving towards but it's it's just we're going to take this one vehicle at a time um, and see how how successful it is especially with with our large area that we cover and the, and the number of miles that we do per day thanks very much well, it's 12 o'clock. Uh, we've had lots of interesting questions. We've had a very interesting presentation bringing together all the aspects of uh, DRT and, and data rights. So I'd like to thank our speakers, um, Alice uh, Missler from, from Hertfordshire and James West from Padang. I'd also like to thank uh, people in the background from Landor who helped to organise this. Uh, so thanks very much. And um, most of all, uh, for the participants who uh, shared all their questions. So I believe the, uh, the slides will be shared. Um, I've been Matthew Clark from Steer. Thanks very much and have a good rest of your day.